was amazing. So we're so thrilled to have him back. Greg Marley has been collecting, studying, eating, growing, and teaching about mushrooms for over 45 years. He has spread the love of mushrooms to hundreds through walks, talks, classes held across New England for the past 30 years. He has two delightful books, um, Chanterelle <laughs> Dreams and Amanita Nightmares, The Love, Lore, and Mystique of Mushrooms. If you can see it here, it's beautiful. And there's some illustrations. It's really a great book and really well written. I totally love it. It is. You're a great writer. Um, and the second one is the one that we're really going to be focusing on more tonight. It's Mushrooms for Health. Tonight's talk is um, on integrating medicinal mushrooms into your life. And so without further ado, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Greg Marley. Well, thank you, Melanie. And I, and I want to thank, you know, Melanie and Joe are both a very class act. They really know what they're doing. Um, so I don't have to worry. And I do, a, I do a lot, a lot, a lot of talks and lectures in my, my other work. And uh, if, unless I'm confident about the audio visual, probably my blood pressure is up another 10 points, um, but I can just relax. And it's good to look across here and see some really old friends and familiar faces. Karen, Jody, lovely to see you both. A few others in there. Um, so we're gonna go and I'm going to be semi monitoring the chat as I go. So if you have specific questions, you might pop them into the chat um, and I, I will try and address them. I can't guarantee it. And if they if they take me off to the left somewhere, uh, I won't do that. But um, but if, if there's someone on focus, I'll try and address them if I see them. So I'm going to produce, you know, moving through a bunch of slides and um, leaving room at the end for any questions we have. So let's play. Um, and I, I, I'm going to really enjoy this. So here we go. And I'm going to be showing a, a number of photographs in, in the, uh, the work that I do here. And uh, almost all of them are photographs of Maine mushrooms. Uh, there's just a couple I will tell you that I did not take. Um, but they're, they're Maine or New England mushrooms. There may be a few up in Canada, Dorothy, um, but we'll, we'll work with that. Um, all right, so let me just make sure I have the chat up. There we go. I'm gonna dive into this and, and it's a, a reminder for me always and for you at the beginning of the end of this, a little bit of roomy, which is um, kind of for me being out in the world, collecting mushrooms, being in nature um, is just a gentle, soothing place for my, my psyche and my soul. Um, so we have roomy here that says that which you are seeking is seeking you. I started playing in, um, in the wild, in nature, from a, an early, early age. Back then, it was in the mesas and deserts of, of New Mexico, where I grew up. Um, but certainly for the past 40-some years, it's been here in Maine and um, in New England, primarily. Um, and for me, mushrooming is an excuse to be out in nature, always. Um, so we're going to be talking about medicinal mushrooms or health-promoting mushrooms. Um, and I've thrown in a couple of other photographs. This is a, a lovely um, Frost's Bolete that's just colorful and gorgeous and edible, but not necessarily. It has some glucans, but not known as a medicinal mushroom. So we're going to talk a little bit about history, history of medicinal mushroom use um, and from different places around the world. Kind of a little bit of biochemistry, how they work in our bodies, the different compounds they have. Um, touching on current or recent medicinal mushroom use uh, here and abroad, um, and then sliding into the idea of that integration, integrating mushrooms into your life as functional food. And then we're going to go through some of the common mushrooms that are medicinal and the idea of some of the psychoactive species of mushrooms and their health benefits, mental health benefits, and a little bit around preservation tips and uh, resources. So there we're going to go. And I'm going to start, you know, we got really excited about the possibility of the medicinal use of mushrooms back around 1992. And that was the year that, that hit the press of this man 
whose body melted out of a glacier up in the Alps. And the Iceman, as he, be, he became known, um, was, you know, had been in that glacier probably a little over 5,000 years. And initially when the body was found, the uh, authorities in the, the town where, where it was reported thought, well, it must be just one of those tourists, one of those hikers that had been frozen in there a few years. And then they started looking at the body. And it was well preserved, you know, some fur clothing and boots and a satchel and some basic tools and two mushrooms. In a leather satchel, there was this pounded mass that they, as they really started looking at it, was a pounded uh, birch, oh, excuse me, tinder conch, Fomis fomitarius. And around a couple of leather thongs, there were chunks of birch polypore. Fomatopsis betulina. And so they really started thinking, well, why? Why did he have these? Um, and did he have them in use? And the Iceman died from the, uh, the effects of a, of a projectile that somebody had either thrown or shot him with, uh, an arrow or a spear that was up in his shoulder. And the Amadou plays two major roles, that tinder conch. One is it is a tinder, and this man was living at around 9,000 feet um, at the end of one of the last major ice ages, and it was cold. And so the ability to use that pounded amadou as a tinder to, to start and transport fire was very much life-preserving. And the other way that, that fam, pounded mass of felt was also really good for binding a wound, stopping blood. And what we've learned is that same mass is pretty strongly antimicrobial. So it could have warded off infection as well as stopping the bleeding. And the birch polypore, which is really common, both these are very common species in our woods. Um, it's also been called the razor strop fungus because it's quite gritty, particularly when it's uh, dried and you can use it to hone a, uh, a knife or in this case, he had a, 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 a bronze, uh, crude bronze ax as well. And it's fairly broadly antimicrobial, very bitter um, decoction or tea. Um, and you drinking that it would, it would, uh, help to purge things like intestinal parasites and, and boost some immunity. It's directly antimicrobial. And Utsi, as they dissected his body, um, they found that he had a pretty significant uh, bunch of, uh, of intestinal parasites. And the birch polypore might have been good for that. So that's way back 9,000 years ago. And we're not sure but there's a, certainly for our imagination, maybe he was using these species. But how far back? And our knowledge of uh, ancient people's use of medicinal mushrooms is as limited as our, uh, our ability to translate their messages. Do they leave written language? We certainly, as, a, as an invading uh, variety of humanity, have squashed a lot of the history in many cultures. And we'll talk about that with North America. But our longest and deepest um, records come from China. And China is one of those countries. It's got by far the longest um, history of written records and written, written information, written language. Um, they had an early bureaucracy, some of it religious, some of it governmental. Um, and it's also one of the cultures in, this, in the world that is perhaps among the most mushroom loving, mycophilic. And hundreds of mushroom species are integrated both medicinally and as food. And sometimes it's hard to, to tease out what they're using for food and what they're using for medicine because both and. I have a, a close friend who is a um, second generation uh, immigrant from China family. And she went back a few years ago and she's passionately interested in mushrooms. And she went into some of the apothecaries there and just was floored by the number of species. They were very protective. They didn't want her taking photographs, but she brought some home. So more than 7,000 years at least of integration of medicinal mushrooms. 
Now, in Europe, our understanding is much more fragmentary, and their use does not seem to have been well um, established, well as much integrated as, as, as some of the China, Japan, uh, Korea. Um, and the use of written language does not go back as far, but certainly we got some records from Greek and Romans, um, and it was not really clear when they talked about the mushrooms what they were referring to. Medicinal mushrooms, they often called agaricum, and certainly the woody polypore Fomatopsis officinalis, a quinine conch, was one of those. Um, but they also, for a while, the Romans called all mushrooms, edible mushrooms, boletus, not just the, the spongy boletes. So a little uncertain there. And a lot of that early, uh, some of that knowledge was uh, squashed by, by some of the plague uh, and, and the uh, pushing back of culture then. So some other countries around the world with a long history we know about Certainly Japan, maybe not as deep and long as, as China, but Korea, Malaysia, um, different. Some of the countries in Africa use mushrooms very deeply for both food and medicine. Um, in the Central America, parts of South America, we don't know as much, but certainly a long history of using psychoactive fungi um, like psilocybin. And the Mexican highlands, still the same way, very mushroom loving um, traditional culture there as well as some of the indigenous uh, peoples, the first peoples in North America. And here, certainly um, Western man's squashing of their culture, we lost a lot of that learning because they, they have an oral history and passed information on that way. We have a little bit more in some of the, uh, the communities and tribes uh, up in uh, Canada, particularly Western Canada along the coast. Um, but certainly we know they used a fair number of of, of mushrooms. And I want to point out this photograph. I call this, this guy Fungus King because he reminds me so much of Angus King. Um, but he was uh, uh, Tom Cowrie, I believe is his name, was the artist who carved this in, in a dead maple tree up in um, uh, uh, Belfast, Maine. And over time, I kind of watched as different mushrooms began fruiting on it as they, they began to break down that wood. And the last ones before they cut out the panel of the, uh, of the, uh, the face was uh, the artist conch, which seemed, uh, I don't know, somehow fitting. And here's the artist conch. Um, growing out of a, of a, a dead uh, aspen. And I love it because it grew fast enough to kind of cover the uh, shellfish prohibition sign that was on the tree. So let's talk about some of the, the, the compounds. And as we've learned more, we're beginning to understand a bit more about how some of the chemical components of mushrooms affect our history. And the ones, particularly in, in the mushrooms that support immunity, the one that we really focus on are these long chain polysaccharides, these sugars that are part of the cell wall structure of the mushroom. And we call them glucans. There's a variety of different kinds, glucans and glycans and proteinated glycans and different branching patterns. They're very complex, very large um, molecules. And in our body, we don't digest them. They pass through as kind of roughage, as fiber. But along the way, they interact with our immune system and stimulate the, the, the immune system. It's, it's as if the, um, our immune receptors look at them and say, ooh, this is some kind of vague, strange, invading body. And so it knocks them up a notch. And they only work on a functional immune system. So for people who might use them um, to support cancer treatment or something else, it's best if they use them either before or after chemotherapy or radiation that would knock down immune functioning. So in our bodies, they do a bunch of stuff. They stimulate both the production of macrophages and things like natural killer cells and their activity. They stimulate the production of some of the white blood cells, the lymphocytes, the B cells and the T cells, and trigger them to mature into more cytotoxic, more active um, cells. 
And they also increase the production of things like cytokines and interleukins, which are involved in, in, in immune response and tumor necrosis factor. So lots of stuff. You could spend days learning that. But the reality, you know, underneath that is that they stimulate our immune systems to better fight invasive organisms and cancers and, and potentially infectious uh, coming in. Um, and within cancer use, they, they have a, a, the ability to shrink some forms of cancer cells. They also have been used a lot to, to slow down or mediate some of the side effects that are produced by chemotherapy and radiation therapy. And there's a lot of popular use around the world of for someone whose cancer has come into remission to keep using things like medicinal mushrooms and other immune stimulants to kind of keep a boosting immunity to assist with prevention. And in terms of you and I, when we're healthy, to kind of assist with prevention is always a good thing, particularly when we're running stressed and maybe our diet is not good, um, we're under pressure. And who, who among us the past two years have not felt like they're under stress? Yeah. Me. Um, and in Western parts of the world, especially, they're often used along with chemotherapy and radiation. Um, some uh, Eastern countries are using them alone, um, but so there's some choice points there. So those are the glucans, the long chain polysaccharides. There's some other things that some mushrooms have that are also help to boost our health. There's a whole lot of mushrooms that uh, have different forms of terpenes or triterpenes or sesquiterpenes, which are these organic molecules. And they, some of them have, are very much bioactive. There's a lot of them in mushrooms like reishi or chaga and some of the fomatopsis. Um, oyster mushrooms contain uh, this lovastatin that's uh, similar to, to uh, it's a, it's like a naturally occurring form of levostatin, and it works works on uh, blood cholesterol and atherosclerotic plaques. We're going to talk about all mushrooms. Pretty much every mushroom uh, makes vitamin D or pro vitamin D, in the same way that our bodies make cholesterol, they make ergosterol. Ergosterol in sunlight converts to vitamin D. We'll talk about nerve growth stimulators in heresium, and then there's some other things. Um, uh, let's talk about how they're being used in this country, around the world, in different countries, Japan, China, some other Eastern countries, they are approved as adjunct treatments for cancers. In fact, for many years, one of the more popular anti-cancer medications in Japan was a, a concentrated uh, fraction of turkey tail and it's still being used pretty heavily we'll talk about that more and as i said they're usually used with chemotherapy and radiation and certainly why you know to reduce relapse in, in when someone's in remission um for many people they're used as a tonic to kind of boost a little bit of immunity that's how i use chaga all through the winter um, to kind of boost immunity as an anti-inflammatory um, so, and for all of us, the opportunity to use them as functional food. So there are some areas where there's ongoing research and it's been slow, but uh, certainly in, in a number of areas, uh, some mushrooms around uh, arthrosclerosis, cholesterol, lipid balance, particularly the oyster mushrooms, um, some with diabetes management, both heresium as well as uh, um, uh, Hint of the Woods. Cancer I talked about, anti-inflammatory is a big area for some species. Um, and with the heresium, I'll talk about around nerve regeneration, cognitive decline, uh, boosting our, our thinking and keeping our mind sharp. And we'll talk about the psychedelics separately. So as we go, don't hesitate to uh, pop questions into the chat should you want to. So where I have gone in my personal life is right here. You know, that whole 
Hipp Hippocratic oath about, you know, letting medicine be your food and food be your medicine. How do we use mushrooms as part of our diet that are helpful? And I, I've done some surveys. Uh, one, I, I did a survey about three years ago of people just to find out how they use mushrooms. And um, I ask about food, I ask about health benefits medicinally, um, what species they favored. And there were a, a number of people, particularly individuals who said, you know, I've been collecting mushrooms and eating mushrooms for 20 years, for 30 years, for 15 years. And a lot of those people say, you know, I don't differentiate between edible mushrooms and medicinal mushrooms, because in my, I, my opinion, you know, wild mushrooms, as long as they're, they're, they're edible, they're good for my diet, they're good for my health. So I see them all as health, health benefiting. So the functional food is a concept of food that is regularly eaten as a regular part of diet that also has added benefits. They enhance health, they reduce risk. Um, and around mushrooms, there have been some studies done, most of them in Japan, and they do these whole population uh, studies. And they've shown that in, in regions of Japan that have a, a high use of mushrooms, high uh, cultivation of mushrooms, and where they study diet with individuals who eat more helpings of mushrooms every week, they've been showing them that they are actually preventative. They go much lower risk of some forms of cancer. So eat your mushrooms. And here one, this umbrella polypore is a, uh, a relative of the hen of the woods or myataki that is wonderful. It's a, I, I love it. It's a great part of, of diet when I find it. And I, I don't find it nearly often enough. So let's talk about some of the mushrooms. And we're gonna be dealing with the mushrooms that are relatively common in, in New England. Um, in our forests, in, in our fields, um, and those we're going to be focusing on. And some of these are really popular edibles, and some of them are primarily medicinal. And I'm going to start with the hen of the woods, which in the surveys I'd done asking people to list their favorite mushrooms, hen of the woods is generally about number three behind chanterelles and black trumpets. And anywhere, if you live in an, a forested area or a suburban area that has a lot of oak trees, particularly large mature ones, and also large ash trees, this is a, a mushroom you're gonna find. It's a mushroom that grows as a, as a heart rotter or butt rotter. So in the lower part of the, of the stem of the tree and it degrades, it breaks down. And people call it a, a weak parasite because it is breaking down that dead heartwood of a living tree. And it can live on an oak tree or an old ash tree for many, 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 many years. I find it most heavily, maybe 90% of the time on oaks. I find it some on ash and occasionally I find it on beech and rarely other hardwoods. Um, and always you find it on the ground, around the tree, rarely, I'll show you a picture of one growing on, a, on, a, on wood, I'll explain that in a minute. Um, and it's pretty common, easily identifiable. And the top of this photograph, the top one is a, is a young, maybe about five inches diameter, very, very young emerging. And the one below is pretty mature. Uh, this is also a mushroom that's uh, easily cultivated or relatively easily cultivated. Um, and you can find it, uh, I, I love it just as, as food, and I also use it kind of as a, as a as functional food. Every year when I find this, my first meal is typically just to chop it up coarsely and uh, saute it with uh, in, in either butter or a mild oil with a little bit of tamari and some garlic and just have it over a bed of rice as a meal. It's wonderful, nice flavor, nice texture, firm. Um, and this, this is a cluster that was probably about, oh, eight to 10 inches in diameter. And it's just perfectly mature without getting too old. Uh, these grow, you can find them mature anywhere from about six inches to over two feet. Um, and this picture here that shows them kind of pushing up against the base of the oak tree, that's pretty typical within a foot or so of the tree. 
on the ground almost always, and every now and then in a well rotted log. And this was a tree where I've seen the, the, the head of the woods fruiting for maybe 10 years. And big windstorm this year knocked the tree down early on. And this fall, heavy fruiting of multiple clusters of hen of the woods. And this one um, was growing out of the tree, out of a break in the tree. And in the upper right hand corner of this, I have a photograph of the underside of one of those little frond like uh, divisions that shows very smooth, almost very tiny, tiny white pores underneath there. As it matures, if you're going to notice at some point, it starts to get a little bit of yellow. And that means the, the, the head of the wood is probably over mature. Now, I don't know about the rest of you. Yeah, Amanda says, I love them on my eggs. Yeah. <laughs> um, this mushroom this fall was, I've never seen it fruiting so heavily, ever. And it was everywhere, anywhere I have found it before, it was fruiting and there's more. If you find one of these trees fruiting, remember where it is, because it will continue to fruit from that tree for many years. The first one I ever found was in the early 1980s outside of Camden, Maine, and it still fruits. The tree is essentially hollow, but it still pushes out an occasional fruiting body of the head of the woods in the fall. And I look for them starting, if we have some cold nights in August, you might find them toward the end of August. And then the heaviest fruiting tends to be in September and into October. Yeah, George says, I got to get another GPS and travel more and just have a good memory. Yeah. So Karen asked, do, you, do cultivated mushrooms contain the same and same amounts of, the, of medicinal compounds? So everything depends on how the mushrooms are treated, a little bit on what they're grown on if they're cultivated, and then how are they treated after they're, they're um, harvested? If you, you know, store the mushroom outside the refrigerator for a number of days, the glucans start to break down. So you want to get them young and fresh. I show this picture. You can see the two oak trees in this photograph. Both of them have multiple clusters of hen of the woods at the base of them. And I had walked in, this was about mm, just about a mile from the parking lot where I was. And I had been, I'd, I'd known that these trees occasionally will fruit them, fruit hens. And that day, between five large oak trees within a small area, I, I didn't pick them and weigh them, but I estimate there were probably about 150 pounds or more of Hen of the Woods. I took one cluster because that's all I could use. I already had some at home. My dehydrators were working and that's one of the things I'm going to challenge you about. Don't take out more than you think you're going to need or use. Leave the rest to distribute their spores or for the next person walking through to collect them. So medicinally, um, the head of the woods um, is a very excellent medicinal. It contains a pretty ver good variety of those beta-glucans of different branching patterns, um, strong and immune modulator. Um, has been shown to, to be effective in some cancers. There are even some early clinical trials happening in this country. Um, Joe, Melanie, I see that there's a, a Liz Day that's trying to enter. I, I don't know if you noticed that. Um, it also has been shown, and when they did the phase one clinical trials, they found that the hen of the woods, the myotaki, also slightly reduces people's blood sugar. And they said, hmm, that, that's something we, we need to make people aware of. And in, with our diets, many people's blood sugar tends to run a little high. So the, it's triggered some, some looking at this for potential uh, for diabetes management as well. Um, let's see. Is it okay to eat mushrooms raw? Cynthia, that is an excellent question. Really? You need to cook your mushrooms. There are some mushrooms that are wonderful edibles 
but if you eat them raw, they'll sicken you. It has a, a, a toxin that gets broken down in the heat. And almost all mushrooms are really hard for us to digest. And cooking helps to make, to break down those, those uh, glucans and chitins in the cell walls to make them digestible. Um, but, you know, the head of the woods is great that you put this up right now. I gave a cluster to a neighbor of mine who had been admiring them. And as she went about cleaning the house and running her errands throughout the day, she was breaking off pieces and just eating it. And she got sick. She didn't get sick because she was poisoned. She got sick because her stomach could not manage the raw mushrooms. And we have a very effective way of getting rid of them. So let's move on to Heresium, the lion's mane. And this is a group in our region, it's, it's a group of two or three different species. Um, and they all have very overlapping characteristics. They all have overlapping um, edibility and, and medicinal use. So they've got a variety of, of common names, lion's mane, comb tooth, bear's head tooth, pom-pom, at least the, the cultivated ones. Uh, Heresium is the genus. Heresium arenaceus is the common form that you find cultivated. Um, and we also have in this, in this state very commonly Heresium americanum and Heresium coralloides or ramosum. Back in the west, west coast is part of the Rockies. They have one that grows on um, uh, abies, um, fir trees, uh, Heresium abiides as well. And you can see it's just like an ice fall of teeth that are attached to wood, not growing on the ground, always on wood. Um, and they're pretty common in the fall, anywhere from sometimes the end of August, more commonly from mid-September through till the end of October. Uh, the most common trees I find them on are beech and birch and maple, occasionally, occasionally oak. Um, and just like the head of the woods, these are rotters, wood rotters. They, they're breaking down the dead portion of, of a tree when it's living, and more commonly, they're breaking down uh, dead wood. So very easily identified. It's a really, really good edible. Um, some people who are pretty strict vegetarian, but recall their days of liking seafood, they'll call this uh, the crab of the wood or the shrimp of the woods. Um, and very common. I, Collect, I purchased some of this cultivated just a week or so ago. This is what it looks like. Um, the, the coralloides, the longer teeth are about an inch long up to um, just attached to the side of a tree, pure white. Sometimes when it's really young, it's a little pink. If it starts to yellow or turn pinkish when it's older, it means it's getting over mature and turning bad. So medicinally, these have some of those beta-glucans, which are that the stimulate immune immunity and um, pretty strongly shown to be anti-tumor in animal studies. I haven't, I'm not aware of any clinical trials with humans. And the most exciting thing that we've learned about these is the couple of compounds in them that stimulate the production of nerve growth factor. So they stimulate our bodies to, to, make, uh, to make nerve or to grow nerves out. And because it stimulates nerve growth factor, it's able to act beyond the blood-brain barrier. So the early studies in, in this have been around dementia and improved mental health. Um, there have been some early clinical trials just with using dried fruiting bodies. One of these was uh, about 15 years ago in Japan, um, working with a, a, a group of older adults with mild to moderate um, dementia, Alzheimer's dementia. And they, they used dried fruiting bodies only along with the, the regular diet. And they found that it would definitely improve their cognitive function, you know, memory, thought process, and they retained it, though after they stopped using it, the effect went down. So they had to, they, they began to keep using it. Um, there's another trial in Japan, about 30 uh, menopausal or premenopausal women who were struggling with anxiety and related depression, and they found a significant increase you know, in the symptoms of anxiety and depression during this trial with just, again, the fruiting bodies. And I want to tell you, Joe asked me to point out this knife. 
because <laughs> she saw it in the last pro program I do. You'll notice in a lot of my slides, I use a knife and I use a knife to show size of, of, of the mushroom scale. I also use it to cut the mushrooms. And this particular knife was an open L knife that uh, a wonderful artist named Jack Vessery um, took and did all this really fine detail carving and etching um, and gave it to me as a gift. It's just beautiful. Um, so I used it a lot for photographs the past year. So that was the um, hen of the woods, or excuse me, the, uh, the uh, comb tooth or lion's mane. I want to move on to oyster mushrooms. Uh, a very common edible mushroom, one of the easiest mushrooms if you're interested in cultivation. Um, and in northern New England, we have three common wild species. And they, they break up the year pretty nicely. This is a group of mushrooms, the Pleurotus, that are very passionate and aggressive rotters of wood. And they work on hardwoods. In the spring, we find the aspen oyster, usually on aspens, dead wood or branches on large aspen trees. In midsummer, we find um, Pleurotus pulmonarius on maple and beech. And late fall, we find it on sugar maple. Karen, were you raising your hand? Or were you just playing? Sorry, I wasn't raising my hand. I, did, it, I didn't know the software does that. If you, I was just resting my hand, yeah, fiddling with my hair. Sorry about that. <laughs> well, lovely to see you there. It's nice to see you too. So um, this photograph here uh, was taken outside of Hope, Maine. I live in near there. And I was driving by one day and there was this big old um, senescent dying maple sugar maple that had, I don't know, 30 pounds of beautiful prime oyster mushrooms. And being, trying always to be uh, compassionate and ethical, I went and knocked on the door. This man answered, I said, excuse me, introduced myself and said, do you mind if I take some photographs and maybe collect some of the oyster mushrooms growing on your tree? He said, what oyster mushrooms? So I showed him and he asked about him. I talked about him. He said, yeah, yeah, take whatever you want. Just leave some for me. I said, no problem. Um, and they were just, these ones are that perfect eating stage where the, the cap is still a little bit rolled under. They're very firm and fresh. Um, the, the flesh is pretty firm. They take a long, slow cooking, um, but they're, they're wonderful. So this is the fall in, in Midcoast, Maine, where I live. We typically don't see these until about mid-October. In more northern and higher elevations, they start in late September at times. And they'll fruit well into December some years. The one that's in midsummer is Pleurotus pulmonarius. Um, even in the heat, heat of summer, if there's good rains, this will fruit on beech and maple typically. Um, I like it. It's the, one of the best flavored of the three. Um, you do, it has a, a little short, very dense, tough stem or stipe. You often need to cut that off, but, but it's a beautiful, pure, pure white mushroom. And then in the spring is the Pleurotus populinus, the aspen oyster. And in a dark forest on a cloudy spring day, the bright creamy white just shines out. You need to, you know, you'll be in a race with certain beetles and bugs that also like to eat these. So you might need to evict some borders. So medicinally, this does have some of those beta-glucans to stimulate immunity, for sure. Um, it's been some studies uh, in, in, in animal lines um, around tumor uh, work. It's kind of been more known for its ability to lower blood cholesterol. And I'm not saying if you struggle with high cholesterol, I'm not saying you throw out your, your statins, but certainly you want to eat more oyster mushrooms. The flavor is really nice as well. I would say, Amanda, you say, that's a great question. When you say long, slow cooking, how long, how slow, what do you mean? So cooking for, you know, as you learn mushrooms, each one of them is different. You think about cooking fish. You cook sole very rapidly. You know, it doesn't take long at all. You know, other things take longer based on their thickness and the density of the texture of the, of the flesh. You'll learn mushrooms. So with oyster mushrooms, particularly, 
Um, some of them are fairly thick fleshed and they're dense. And so uh, kind of a low, slow cooking helps to break that down and release the nutrients and the flavors. But with each mushroom, you'll begin to learn. Um, black trumpets, rapid, rapid cooking is fine. Uh, do cooking times change for dried mushrooms? So the first thing, George, you want to make sure you soak them first, soak them in water so they reabsorb that. And then you still need to cook them, particularly if it's a mushroom that's toxic raw. Um, but cooking, again, breaks down that cell wall and makes, the, makes them more easily digested. So I want to talk about chaga. And I, chaga is, a, is an odd little fungus. It, you find it on typically birch trees. I find it sometimes on hop hornbeam, and it is a parasite. It's a parasite on a living tree, and you'll see <laughs> this very black, looks like a charred mass on the side of the tree coming out. And that is not a mushroom, it's not a fruiting body, but it is a mass of the um, structural hyphae of the fungus that acts as kind of like a, a battery. It fuels the growth of, of a fruiting body when the tree dies. And it's unmistakable, um, particularly if you crack it open and it's gold and brown on the inside, very, very tough and woody, you would never consider it as an edible mushroom. This is a mushroom that likes older, more mature birches. It sometimes will grow on birches for many, many, many years, um, damaging the tree but not killing it. Sometimes others, it, it will kill relatively quickly. And there is a danger and a concern that particularly in more southern regions in Maine and southern, you know, further south in New England, that this is getting over harvested. It is not as common as it used to be, and it's slow growing. So we're really asking people to be very aware of the potential for over harvesting. Um, if you're in northern Maine, northern western Maine, up into Canada, uh, in it's really, really common in some areas, but be aware for your area. It grows as far south probably as down into Pennsylvania in, in the, the mountainous areas of Pennsylvania. <clears throat> so when you see it coming out of a tree, this is what it looks like. And it's, you know, it's tough and hard. Um, you can often, you don't want to chop the tree to get it out, but if you strike the, uh, the side of that with something like a, a rock or a, or a side of a hatchet, it, it'll, it'll break off cleanly. And as long as the tree's healthy, it will slowly grow back. It'll, it'll re, regrow. Um, in terms of the medicinal use of it, um, longest history, this has been used by the, the, the Siberians and in Russia. Um, uh, for hundreds of years, mostly uh, for uh, treatment of stomach ailments, stomach cancers. Um, and it's, uh, it's a good general tonic, immune tonic with a lot of the glucans. And I tend to value it for some of the terpenes, which are both anti-cancer and anti-inflammatory. In my life, I use it as a tea or a tincture through the colder months um, and it prevents me from getting bronchitis, which is something I had struggled with for the first 20 years I lived in Maine, once or twice a winter. And I've had two very mild cases in the past 20 years since I started using chaga. And it, as a tea, it tastes really good. So here, I want to show this upper photograph here shows the, you can see at the base of that chaga growth, a, a hole. As the, the fungus, the mycelium is uh, degrading or, or infecting the wood, it also softens it. And you'll find woodpeckers will choose to dig a, a, a nesting hole into wood that has been infected by some kind of wood degrading mushroom because it softens it up. So here, traditionally chaga is the only mushroom that's collected in the winter and would be still vital in the winter. And historically, um, in parts of Russia, they would traditionally go out and collect it only in the winter, in part because it's easier to see when the leaves are off the tree, and in part because, you know, these people who were farmers and foresters, winter was when they had the time. So they would go collect and harvest. 
let's see what you're saying, George. So Stacy asked, what is the fruiting body if we can't see it? I can tell you, it took me years before I found fresh fruiting bodies. I haven't shown a picture. It grows as a sheet of tubes, usually under the, the, uh, the bark of a dead birch tree. Um, very distinctive. If you're really interested at the end, I'll pull up a photograph of it. <clears throat> so the areas of research with chaga are around pain management. I know some folks who use it for bursitis and joint pain very effectively uh, for systemic infl in inflammation and uh, you know, infection protection is primarily preventative. A lot of you know, clinical trials with humans are pretty lacking with this species but it makes a very handsome, oops, okay, very handsome uh, cup of tea. This was a friend of mine sent me this photograph. So another medicinal which is not typically edible are the reishi or hemlock varnish conch or the varnish conchs. Um, and this is a beautiful, gorgeous uh, fruiting body mushroom that grows on wood the species we have up in northern New England here mostly is Ganodermatsuge, and it grows on hemlock, first and foremost. Secondarily, I, I find it occasionally on, on spruce. Um, and there are a couple of close related species in this complex that I find on maple, and that's typically Ganoderma lucidum or oak, and that's Ganoderma kurtzii. Uh, it's used medicinally as a tea or a tincture, sometimes a, a powder, um, because it's not very tasty. It's very, very, very bitter. Um, and though it's not considered edible, when it first comes out of the tree, before it begins to develop the color, when it's pure white or creamy white, some people eat it then. Um, I, I, I don't, because I tend to prefer it as, as a medicinal. When it you can find it on a recently cut or dead hemlock. This was a partial picture of a hemlock stump that probably had about 30, three zero fruiting bodies around it when I took this photograph. And you can see that white rim of the cap. That means it's still actively growing. It's not mature yet. Um, and it probably is just beginning to drop its spores. I tend to collect this mushroom when the, when the spores are actively dropping because those spores have medicinal components as well. And so it's full of life. If you wait too long, it's an annual fruiting body and it'll begin to mold. And you don't want to collect and use medicinally moldy mushrooms. And that, that's not good. And so it starts typically fruiting end of May, late May, early June, depending upon the rainfall patterns, and you'll get a flush that grows in the next six to eight weeks. And then if we have a good rainy season, you'll get occasional refruitings. And it can mature in a wide variety of sizes. So in this photograph, you can see some of them are about, you can't, I, there's a pen there that show you scale. Some of them are about an inch to two inches across. Some of them are about six inches across and they're all lying on one that was about 16 inches across. So it really varies depending upon how much moisture is available and how large a food source. So the medicinal properties, you know, some cultures, China, Japan, it, you know, they believe that reishi or ling shi in China, it's almost like it walks on water. It's almost a panacea. And that may be going too far, but it's been used medicinally for thousands of years and still highly, highly valued as an immune enhancement, as an anti-tumor, antiviral, antimicrobial. There was some uh, Chinese uh, Olympic teams, particularly some of the high altitude ones that use it for enhancing endurance, it tends to lower cholesterol, anti-inflammatory. Like I said, it's got a lot of uses um, and it's used in a variety of forms. Uh, some of the traditional Chinese medicine practitioners will use, they will collect and use the, the spores and they'll try and crush them and crack them open. Um, it makes a great tincture, very complex tincture, as well as a very bitter, powerful tea. You're, you're going to, you know, you're going to be using something medicinal when you have this as a tea. <clears throat> 
And when I say tea, I'm talking decoction. So a slow cooking in water, not pouring water over the mushroom in that respect. I'll talk about that at the end. So closely related to the reishi um, is the artist conch. Same genus, but this is a perennial mushroom. It gets quite woody and it can grow on a large tree, dead or dying tree. It can grow 24, 30, 36 inches across and get you know 10 years, 12 years old. It can be quite large. I just wanna see um, George said you cut a you cut a chaga on your tree and it or on your property and it's not growing much yet. Yeah, takes time if the tree is healthy. Yeah. Um, so with the artist conch or Ganoderm aplanatum, you know I don't typically collect this for medicinal use, particularly if it's large. Um, there are, if you're going to collect it medicinally and use it that way, I, I look for it on aspens. On a dead aspen, it'll grow rapidly for a couple of years, so it'll be thin and rather large, um, and you know it's going to die quickly because it'll exhaust the tree. So, but if it's on a, a large one on a tree, I leave it because they're beautiful. Just leave them and, and allow them to, to continue growing. In the West Coast, there's another species that's very similar. So these are two that we're growing. And you'll find in the middle, you know, late summer, early fall, around one of these mushrooms, you'll, you'll see the, the coating of this glorious reddish brown spore powder. Millions and millions of spores they drop. And they'll come around and by, I think it's hydrostatic uh, association, and start to coat the top of the mushroom where the underside is this pure, pure white, though if you bruise it, it turns brownish. That's the artist con part of it. I'll show you a picture of that. Medicinally, this is very similar to the reishi. Similar group of glucans as well as terpenes. Um, and again, would make a very potent tea. And for artists, you know, my friend Kendra Baver had made a, a series of these in one year. She's a great artist. So this is a, if you take a fresh artist conch and you use a scribe, a needle or something to scratch it, it stains brown pretty rapidly. And then if you preserve it, that, that stain will stay, stay true. Um, so long history of using this um, as a form of folk art. All right, one or two more species, and then we're gonna finish here into some other areas. I wanna talk about turkey tail. Turkey tail across all of our woods, incredibly common, though there are some lookalikes. It's a thin, leathery, annual fruiting body. So that means it starts to grow. Maybe it'll start to grow in early to mid August, and it'll grow for a month maybe, and then it finishes. So you want to collect it when it's growing actively and that white pore underneath are pure white. It's called Tramites versicolor, versicolor meaning a variety of colors because the cap individually has layers of different color and from one strain to the next, it can really vary anywhere from bluish green to, to, to deep brown to tan, a variety of colors. And there are, as I said, there's a number of lookalikes, but this alternating colors and a little bit of hairiness on the cap are pretty common. And the underside of it, when it's actively growing, pure, pure white, and it takes a hand lens to see the tiny pores. So on this log that you're seeing here, you'll see that there's two color forms. There are two different strains of turkey tail inhabiting that, that mushroom or that, that log, and they'll rarely overlap. They'll kind of butt up against each other. So this is again, not a edible mushroom. It's too leathery and tough. Um, so you can chew on it. Some people chew on them as they walk through the woods and then spit out the fruiting body, but it's got a powerful array of glucans and, and protein connected glucans that are strong immune, immune stimulants. Um, and this is the mushroom that has likely the most by far clinical trials, clinical trials with cancer treatment, 
um, of any mushroom that I'm aware of. Maybe in China and Japan, uh, the, the Rishi or, or Lingxi are, are more, more studied. But starting in the 1970s, uh, the Japanese uh, licensed a, 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 an extraction called, they called PSK. And shortly thereafter, the Chinese licensed a very similar one they call PSP. And those have been sold and licensed and studied and used um, as, as, as anti-cancer medicine. In this country, we still using them as dietary supplements um, and they're sold as dietary supplements. Um, I know a number of people who've used them as part of a cancer treatment regime. And I would certainly support that. So Amanda, chewing the turkey tail will slowly, you know, you'll be the, both the chewing and masticating and your saliva will slowly release some of those glucans for sure. Uh, Karen, this is not one of the mushrooms that's bioluminescent. Good question, good try, but not this one. Sometimes that bright white underside seems like it glows, but not so. So related in terms of its use um, to the, the artist conch is the tinder conch, Fomis fomitarius. It's not as bitter, but it's just as tough to work with because of its woodiness. But I wanted to bring it up because it's, it's, it's an immune stimulant and some antimicrobial. Um, those same long chain polysaccharides. And they've done some alcohol extracts of this that have also, they've been working with uh, inflammation and pain relief with them. Uh, I'm not as familiar with that use for them. So we're gonna leave the ones that are traditionally medicinal. And I wanna talk about the mushrooms that we're really getting a lot more and a lot better research on the use of in, in mental health. And these are some of the psychoactive species. So this quote is from uh, Alice in Wonderland, Lewis Carroll. And, you know, you know it if you've been around a long time. You know, one side will make you grow taller. The other side will great make you go shorter. One side of what? The other side of what, thought Alice to herself? Of the mushroom, said the caterpillar, just as if she had asked it aloud. aloud. And in a moment, that caterpillar was out of sight. So Lewis Carroll wrote this book fairly shortly after there were reports coming out of Siberia and Russia of the use of Amanita muscaria as an inebriant, as a visionary mushroom. So we're going to talk about the, the mushrooms like Amanita muscaria, and we're going to talk about the psilocybe uh, psilocybin containing mushrooms. And we're going to talk about them as two separate groups, because those are two very, very different compounds with different actions on, on, on the psyche. So we know around the world, various psychoactive plants and fungi have been used for centuries. They've been part of ceremony, they've been part of celebration, both. And the initial kind of pop culture knowledge of in this country came in the late 1950s, early 1960s. Um, George Wasson, who was a who was actually a banker by trade, but he was a passionate mushroomer as well with his wife, and they did some studies and and interviews with uh, uh, Culindera down in Mexico, and it was published in Life magazine. This visionary mushroom, and all of a sudden, it caught hold. As a, as a pop culture icon. Uh, the research that was done uh, in, the, in the 60s by Timothy Leary, by other folks like that, and the recreational use um, started a, a wave of people using them as, 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 uh, as recreational uh, components. And particularly when it was, uh, this is also when they started using LSD, also initially extracted from fungus. Um, and late in the 1960s, it all fell apart and federal law was passed that banned it. But during the 50s and the early 60s, there was a lot of research that was done in use in to uh, um, stimulate uh, activity in psychotherapy, for use in treatment in some substance use disorders. Um, and the recent research started out redoing some of the work that was done 
um, in the late 1960s. And then they moved on, particularly John Hopkins Medical School, their Center for Psychedelics Research. They've done some really good research in terms of use with uh, psilocybin, um, with uh, depression and anxiety, particularly anxiety at the end of life. And some now work with PTSD. That whole idea of, of rebooting the mind so these we're talking here, we're talking psilocybin, psilocin, baocysteine, some related uh, compounds um, that are the active components. They're somewhat heat stable. They don't break down under boiling. They're water soluble. So people often make a tea. Um, and if you take in these compounds, you start to feel the effects within about 30 minutes. And typically duration lasts three to five hours. And certainly the strength of you, the effects and the duration will depend a little bit on dosage as well. What people are doing a lot and playing with and studying is the use of these as microdosing to help uh, stimulate thinking and stimulate um, creativity. Um, I don't know a great deal about that, but it's an active area of, of, of work. So what you get, visual hallucinations, a sense of euphoria, a sense of distorted time sense, you know, that breaking down between that perception of self and the perception of the rest of the universe. So people talk about this sense of oneness. Also a sense of giggles, the acceleration. Um, I do a lot of work uh, with poison centers around toxic mushrooms. And so I look at this also from the risk uh, uh, of it as a toxin. And for most people, they don't have any negative effects other than those people who are a little bit hardwired toward anxiety and maybe carry a bunch of trauma and there's that risk of a bad trip. And for very, very young people, and I'm talking toddlers or babies, it can be quite bad. Um, it can trigger high temperatures as well as convulsions. So beware uh, around that. Um, so this uh, little psilocybe mushroom on wood chips, the photograph, I found these in Maine growing on wood chips. It's occasional here. This is a psilocybin uh, capicensis. Um, I believe I was the first person to ever find them in Maine. Um, so these are indoles that are psychoactive, and they're found in a number of different species of mushrooms in several genuses, genera, uh, certainly the, the species in psilocybe. There are some gymnopolis, and I'll show you another photograph of those shortly, several paneo, paneolis and canosopy. The What I worry more than anything, particularly as a consultant with the poison centers, is people not knowing what they're doing and collecting and eating toxic mushrooms, thinking that they're psychoactive. I've run into that several times. So as I said, it's rarely a problem for adults. Um, but the danger is for young children and um, people that mistake the mushrooms for something else. And by the way, currently under federal law, they are illegal to possess in any form. So keep that in mind. Um, pop culture is really going wild about this. And um, I think that you know, we've seen some areas, cities uh, that are that have decriminalized it, uh, made it legal and consideration in some states, including a bill that was uh, uh, back in the main legislature this year. Also, a number of the species are pretty easily cultivated. Now, let's talk about those other ones, usually focused on Amanita muscaria. And there's some related Amanitas that contain even higher concentrations. Amanita muscaria is the fly agaric. And the compounds we're talking about is called ibotenic acid and uh, a breakdown product called muscimol. And these historically have been used as an inebriant and as a visionary ceremonial mushroom um, in Northeastern Europe up into Eurasia. Um, and as I said, some of the initial reports in the West came out of uh, uh, one was a Swedish POW. Uh, in, in held in Siberia. And I worry about this because it's a pretty complex reaction. I've dealt with a number of uh, poisoning cases where people eat this ostensibly to get high and they also develop shakes um, and sometimes nausea and vomiting uh, as well as 
periods of deep, almost coma-like sleep, coming out of it into a fairly agitated state. So it can be pretty unpleasant. And some people seem to know what they're doing and are very cautious. Um, I am, I have, I don't, I worry about these mushrooms. Some of them have also been shown to contain a little bit of muscarine. And I think that's what leads to the agitation and the shakes. So mm, be cautious. There's other species outside of the muscaria group that contain much higher concentrations and have been very, very dangerous for people who've played with those. Um, Amadina muscaria is beautiful in the western part of the country and over in, in, in Europe and Asia. They're deep, deep cherry red. The variety we have here is more yellowish orange variety Cassawii. This year they were common. I was finding them occasionally in June through the summer and then just a heavy, heavy fruiting through September and October, even into early December, or excuse me, early November in some areas. Beautiful mushroom, probably the most illustrated mushroom in the world. So a nausea vomiting as well as some uh, hallucinations. I was working with a, a group that also, uh, 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 couple, um, father and, and daughter who ate them thinking they were edible and had a very unpleasant experience. So what do we say here? Aren't the spores legal? The spores are legal, but yeah, for the psilocybin. Heather, you make a tropical cream with muscimol GABA for sciatica pain. Hmm, interesting. I'm not, I don't know about that. Um, Fermentation and boiling can, yeah, change the breakdown into muscimol for sure. There's some ways of treating it. I more and more, more than anything else, worry about people going off half prepared. So caution, caution, do your research. So we can ask questions about that when we finish. I wanna do a little bit about preservation before we're done. Um, Oftentimes when you collect mushrooms, you're gonna collect more than you can use right away, particularly the medicinal ones. Um, you only wanna use fresh, actively growing mushrooms for food or for medicine. Um, and often many of them, particularly the fleshy ones will spoil rapidly. So you wanna preserve them in a variety of ways. Refrigeration slows that down. Drying is excellent. Freezing is excellent. Um, we'll talk about tincturing in a second. If I am gonna be saving mushrooms for use into the future, almost invariably the medicinal ones, I dry them. And I use a temperature controlled forced hot air dryer so that the drying happens relatively rapidly. Slow drying outdoors here, our humidity is too high and they have a tendency to mold before they dry. Up in an attic, on screens, sometimes they can dry pretty rapidly but just be cautious of molding. Um, for some medicinal mushrooms, use them as food. Certainly the uh, velvet foot or enyokitake, mayatake, the oyster mushrooms ahead of the woods, shiatake, which is cultivated here though. In some parts of the country, it's escaped cultivation. Horaceum lion's mane, food, food. You can also um, uh, tincture some of those. And there's a, not, a lot of traditional edible mushrooms that also have some of the, the, func the functional food components. I've talked about decoctions, I've talked about tincturing, and let me talk about those. For decoctions, you're talking about a slow, hot water boiling. You bring it almost up to a boil, like with chaga, I'll bring it just to a boil, and then I'll let it simmer a little cooler because the, the, that hot water will begin to break down the glucans so they're available. And it won't volatilize the terpenes if it, if it doesn't boil too strongly. And that decoction, that broth is really what you need to do for turkey tails. It's also a great way to deal with myotaki, oyster mushrooms, and some of the others. With the mushrooms that are not traditionally edible, like reishi or chaga, you make a decoction tea out of them. And I think I saw in the chat, someone says that they, you, you put them in the refrigerator, you grind them, grind chaga and put it in the refrigerator. And that would be a way to get the terpenes, but not the, um, the, the, uh, the immune stimulating uh, polysaccharides because they will not be freed up. That decays to decoction. 
How long do you have to let it steep, so to speak, like in the warm water before you ingest it? So what are you talking about? What species? Um, uh, the turkey tail. Turkey tail, I typically let it simmer for about an hour or two. And then I use it as a broth or as a tea. Uh, you know, one of those uh, crock pots, temperature control is a great way to do that because you have real control over it. So I do a lot of tincturing as well. Um, and I would always, you want a double extraction tincture to, to kind of think about what you want to concentrate in of this, the species that you're using and think about how to best do it. There are some components that are extracted really well in alcohol and alcohol also acts as a preservative. But for any of the immune stimulating glucans, you wanna do the decoction as well. So I do them separately and then I combine them. Um, and that works really well with chaga and reishi. With the heresium, the lion's mane, the, the stimulating, the uh, nerve growth stimulating factors are concentrated easily in alcohol. So I use a double extraction tincture for that as well. And there's some people that are growing out the mycelium rather than taking it all the way to fruiting body and using either dried mycelium or mycelial extracts. And that's really good for the glucans. Some of the terpenes and stuff are not as uh, not concentrated in the mycelium. It really takes the fruiting body. But there's a, there's a whole lot you can learn about this. Um, if you, my first book, The Mushrooms for Health, is still available um, on Kindle. And so it has a, a uh, recipe for a double extraction tincture and some directions on that. So let's talk about good books and resources, Amanda, since you put that in the chat. Let's talk about resources. Here's a great big uh, reishi. Could have even gone bigger, but someone else was going to find it and take it away from me. So I, I, I've been, I watched it for about five weeks before I harvested it. Um, so Mushrooms for Health is, is my book um, that's available, as I said, on Kindle. And it's really, it's part field guide and part use guide to the wild mushrooms up in this part of the world. I don't really deal that much with cultivated varieties in the, in the book. Uh, Chanterelle Dreams, Amanita Nightmares has a couple of uh, chapters on the psychoactive fungi, as well as chapters on edibles and toxic mushrooms. Um, it's it's kind of like a, a mushroom appreciation book in one, in one book. And other books, there's one that's recently published in 2020, uh, way back when, in about 1995, Christopher Hobbs wrote a, a medicinal mushroom book. He wrote again, updating all that material in 2020. Easily available. It's a great little book. Um, it also, you know, really focuses on use of medicinals on the home basis and using home materials. Um, fungal pharmacy, Robert Rogers, who's a Midwestern kind of guy, is a great romp through the use of medicinal mushrooms. Um, and the clinical guide, Martin Powell, it's okay, not my favorite. And on the internet, always with the internet, look at the source of the information. There's some good resources out there, and there's some that are a little sketchy. So let the buyer beware. Um, the, you can use Google search for any of the clinical trials or real scientific studies. Um, the Sloan Kettering Cancer Institute has, has a, a nice website where they have some, some material. Um, there's lots of, of information out there. Take your time, learn. And that's, I think, our, our goal is to, to learn, learn, use, continue to learn. There's a lifetime of learning with, with wild mushrooms. And I certainly recognize that and practice it. And so we, as we come gently back to Rumi and toward the end of this, you know, first and foremost for me is getting out there and appreciating the beauty, the love. There's an intellectual part of this. There's a gastronomic part of this. There's a health promoting part of this, but there's a connection with nature. And for me, that, that combination is why I've been doing this for about 50 years, and I'll continue to do it for as long as I can toddle out into the woods or people can bring me mushrooms. So as Rumi says, let the beauty you love be what you do. There are a thousand ways to kneel and kiss the earth.
And for me, being out there with the mushrooms is a way that balances my life um, with the other work I do out in the world. Um, so are there good books? Okay, you've got that one, Amanda. So I'm gonna stop here and uh, I will stop sharing my screen and come back to you, I hope. How'd I do that? There we go, there you are. So if people have questions, you've done well in the chat. I don't. I may, may have not caught them all. I don't know, um, Melanie, if there's things that you saw that I missed. No, I think you got them all. Wow. So go ahead, ask your questions, unmute. You can raise your hand if you're the introvert. If you're an extrovert, you can say, hey, Greg. I guess we've got a shy group tonight. Well, George, I, I think I've been appreciating some posts you've done around mushrooms over the past year, haven't I? Yes, I put a few on the uh, main mushroom group. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Hi. Gina? Um, that was so interesting. Thank you. I had a question about the location of the mushrooms. You talked a lot about mushrooms that are actually on the trees. Yeah. Are any of these found below the tree or around them on the ground? Yes, certainly, specifically the head of the woods. It almost always grows on the ground. Um, and there are some others, you know, there are, there's a variety, uh, occasionally you'll find of the reishi that I, you know, like that big one I was holding was actually coming from buried roots of a tree. Um, and certainly there's a lot of mushrooms that grow on the ground that are edible with also some medicinal benefits. Many of our edible mushrooms have those glucans that we can enjoy just by using this food. Okay, great. Thank you. No tree climbing necessary. <laughs> so lucky in Maine, there's some species that seem to stop right at the border. What do you mean, Heather? Uh, Caesars, Amanita, never seen it on this side. It's always in Maine. We don't have any oaks left in the north, yeah. so everything yeah. associated with oak. So, yeah, you, you're pretty lucky just over there, which well, I haven't been able to go for a while. Yeah, we, you know, certainly the, the, and you know, I invite people when you're looking for mushrooms, if you're in a new place, the first thing you want to focus on what are the trees? What are the tree species growing here? Because that's going to have the dominant influence on what species you'll find. And, you know, with global warming, Heather, maybe you'll get oak trees growing up there more commonly. We have them. They're just too young now. All the mature ones have been cut down and used for oh, making well, furniture or whatever. Don't blame us then. <laughs> no, I'm not blaming you. I'm just saying you're very lucky. Yes, I've searched and searched. There are some in southern New Brunswick, mind you. Yeah. And mainly in the city, which is, I don't know, with the traffic and the pollution, whether I really want to be getting yeah. there so mushrooms from the side of the road. Yeah, that's a, that's a good caution. Right. Uh, we do, you had we do have one question in about, the... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, you Keith? You talked a little bit. I thought you mentioned black trumpets in the lecture, but I didn't hear you say much specifically about that. Um, could you enlighten us about what uh, health benefits they might have? So I am not familiar with any really designated health benefits for, for black trumpets other than the smile on our faces when we enjoy the flavor. Um, they likely have a little bit of beta-glucans in them, you know, just as those structural elements, but I primarily eat them to make me smile. They taste so good. Tastes good. <laughs> So can you do another class for ID and tips? I want to, <laughs> uh, and you know, who's saying this? Uh, Amanda, one of the things I'm actually thinking about, uh, and I, I haven't convinced anybody, I haven't asked anybody to, to host it, is to do a, a, a mushroom, one of these online lectures that say, all right, what about after the foolproof ones? You know, intermediate edible mushrooms to focus for, for people who have a little bit more background already. Um, so I'm thinking about that because certainly there's, you know, in a given year on average, without bragging at all, because I'm really conservative about what I eat, I probably eat 35 or 40 species. There's a lot of edible mushrooms, but some of them, 
you know, some of them, it took me years to get to the place where I trusted myself to eat them. Um, I, you know, given the poison control work I do, given the fact that I sickened myself that one time in 1986, I'm cautious. It's called smart. Yeah, there you go, Jody. Wisdom. Wisdom comes with age and mistakes. <laughs> what? I have to get old and know something? Wait, I wanted to say, so since the trees are going to be changing, are we likely to find mushrooms on some trees in the south more as we go north? Um, if the tree species change, that is the most determining. And, and, you know, I find, Dorothy, you don't look that young, but I find that really young people, they're really, really, really smart. And then as they get a little older, they change their minds a little bit. So I worry more about the people who say, you know, I know everything that I need to know about mushrooms until they learn. And that's that, that's that beginner's mind that sometimes can, can not be our friend. Been there myself, done that myself. I'll tell you someday about the, the day I ate poke root in New York when I was 17 and got oh violently ill. Poke, shoot, I knew some part of the poke was edible and I just kind of generalized it to the whole thing. So I'm thinking of how the temperatures have changed even since we've been here in Buxton, Maine, and, yeah. and how the trees... You know, people are asking what trees to plant next, and and I'm thinking, and we're on the Saco River. If you want to come and do a, a walk up and down the Saco, you're welcome. I got, <laughs> I got your, I got your bed, baby. And, um, um, yeah, never mind. That's it. Yeah, um, and what I find, you know, since we do have, you know, we've already talked about, you know, gaining about three weeks of growing season or three less weeks of winter. Um, and we're, what I'm seeing is our season, especially in the fall, we're seeing more mushrooms later into the fall, early, you know, up into, into December sometimes. So, and so slower will be the change in tree species. The other thing that's happened here this year is this mad warming in the middle of cold. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay. Bye. Who else? So, George, you say little brown bolete. Yeah, Sutorius eximius or Tylopolis eximius, a lilac brown. That was the one that got me in 86. Yeah. Quite the experience. Got me too. I, I thought I was going to the hospital. I wrote a note next to the pot that I ate. It. I, I had dried it and put it in some stir fry. Probably didn't cook it long enough. And uh, found out what there are two holes in an outhouse. And it's not company. Yeah. Yeah, it was unpleasant yeah. for about 12 hours. Mm. Um, yeah, last year, uh, Cynthia, you asked about how widespread and prolific they were. I, I got to tell you, the, the, the pattern of rainfall and the abundance of rainfall in 2021 triggered, I, I think it was probably the best mushroom year I have ever seen. And I've been in Maine for about 42 years. Um, it was just phenomenal. The spring, not so great. And if you were in far western Maine, yeah, they had a lot of dryness there. But boy, most of the state, just phenomenal. Oh. You're spotlighting me. Okay. Uh, if people want to raise your hand, if there's any more questions, um, we can talk all night. But I'm betting that Joe and Melanie might want to go home at some point. Mm -hmm. Um, for the for the last couple of minutes, my staff was having a sword fight outside. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I was trying really hard not to like to stay composed, but um, I think that the Saco River idea is great, and that you should come down here and visit in person at some point. That would be really fun. Well, I do. I think that <laughs> Melanie is has your emails, and I'm I will I do uh, kind of day long or weekend classes throughout the season, starting midsummer. Um, and these, most of what I'm doing this year is a, a lecture portion on Zoom on identification features, and then a three hour walk out in the woods someplace. 
So I'm offering those and um, I, I'll be happy to send out a, a list of them once I get, get the schedule set. Let us know, maybe we could host something around here. We partner with um, this big park nearby called Clifford Park. So maybe we could have right. you down here sometime. I think people would love that. So give us the hands if you think that's a great idea. <laughs> 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 yeah, well, certainly there there seems to be interest in that bit of Saco area. <laughs> Thank you so much, Greg, for everything. Um, we've really appreciated the two sessions that you've done for us, and we'll we'll definitely have you again in the future. All right. And, and Sa Sally, were you waving at me, or did you have a question before we finish? No, she said to raise the hands if we if she oh. if you're going to come down oh. here and hang out with us southern people. <laughs> so all the right. vote is complete. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you all for joining us again. I'm Melanie. I'm at MacArthur Library in Biddeford. If you have questions or comments, please feel free to um, send us an email, get in contact with us at the library. And thank you, Greg, for spending another evening with us. You're sure welcome. This was fun. I always enjoy it. Have yes. a great night, everyone. Take care, folks.